The Royal Australian Air Force was somewhat unique in operating the F-111, known to them as the Pig, although more commonly known as the Aardvark outside of Australia. The RAF was one of only two organisations to operate the type, with the other being the United States Air Force. For Australia, the F-111 was a strange purchase. At the time, it was incredibly expensive and controversial, and seems excessive for a country like Australia. But the RAF still acquired it, so that leads to the question of why the RAF bought the F-111, which in my opinion is an interesting story. So in this video, I'm going to discuss the aircraft's background, alongside why Australia bought it, and how it fared in Australian service. First and foremost then, what is the F-111? While the F in its designation might imply that the F-111 is a fighter aircraft, it's also a bomber. The F-111 was originally developed under the Tactical Fighter Experimental Program, also known as the TFX Program. The TFX Program was started due to a desire for new aircraft by both the US Navy and US Air Force during the late 1950s. The US Air Force primarily wanted an aircraft that could fill the capability gap of its current F-105 Thunder Chief. The new aircraft would be capable of taking off on poor quality and short runways, be able to fly at Mark 2.5 at high altitude and at Mark 1.2 at low altitude, and be able to fly transatlantic missions without refueling. Due to the need for a highly efficient wing that was capable of subsonic and supersonic flight, the United States Air Force chose a variable swept wing as this would allow the aircraft to fly efficiently at a variety of speeds. At the same time, the Navy wanted a new fleet defence fighter to supplement and partially replace the F-4 Phantom in this role. This was primarily due to the lack of loiter time of the Phantom. As a result, the Navy began development of the F-6 Missileer, which was subsonic but had a longer loiter time. The choice of a subsonic aircraft became controversial within the Navy, but it was all for naught as the Department of Defence saw the development of the Missileer and the TFX as developing the same technologies at the same time, and therefore it was wasteful. As a result, in 1961, the Navy was forced to join the TFX program, which would be led by the Air Force. The program being led by the Air Force proved controversial, and led to the Navy attempting to remove itself from the program on multiple occasions. This mainly stemmed from the Navy and Air Force requirements being more different than the Department of Defense believed. Eventually, the TFX was renamed the F-111 Aardvark, and General Dynamics was selected as the manufacturer. In 1963, the Australian government signed on to the program, with the UK government signing on in 1965. This resulted in the initial development and production run having five variants, with the F-111A as a tactical bomber and FB-111A as a strategic bomber, both for the United States Air Force, the F-111B for the US Navy, the F-111C for the Royal Australian Air Force, and the F-111K for the Royal Air Force. Eventually, the US Air Force also developed the F-111D, E, and F models, and the FB-111A was later converted to the F-111G after the FB-111A was made surplus to requirements by the B-1 Lancer. Additionally, 42 F-111As were converted by the US Air Force into electronic warfare aircraft designated EF-111A Raven. The US Navy and Royal Air Force eventually cancelled their orders, leading to the US Air Force and Royal Australian Air Force being the only operators of the F-111. Australia's F-111C was unique in the sense that it was a hybrid between the US Air Force's F-111A and FB-111A, as well as the US Navy's F-111B. With the base being an F-111A, with the longer wings of the Navy's F-111B and the stronger undercarriage of the FB-111A. Alongside the F-111C, the RAF also wanted a reconnaissance variant. The original plan was to have them direct from the factory, but this didn't happen, so six were converted into RF-11Cs at a later date. With the knowledge of what the F-111 was designed for and capable of, it raised a lot of questions about why Australia was interested in this type of aircraft. Why did Australia need a long-range supersonic bomber? Who were we planning on using it against? For that, we have to look at the geopolitical situation of Southeast Asia after World War II. In the immediate post-war period, the RAF was the world's fourth largest air force. While impressive, especially for a country as small as Australia, this was deemed unnecessary, so the RAF rapidly downsized. The decision was taken to keep a decently sized bomber force. This bomber force was originally made up of American B-24 Liberators, but was later made up of British Avro Lincolns. The RAF were fully aware that by the time the first Lincoln arrived in Australia in 1946, it was obsolete. But the RAF wanted a cheap stopgap that would provide an effective bomber force that would replace the wartime liberators and remain effective until a proper jet-powered replacement arrived. Not long after they were delivered, the Cold War went hot in Asia, with Australia then being dragged into both the Korean War and Malay Emergency. In 1950, the Royal Australian Air Force deployed Lincoln bombers out of Singapore against communist insurgents in Malaysia. In this role, the Lincolns proved hopelessly ineffective. The Lincolns were designed for fighting in Europe against the German Reich, not communist forces in the jungles of Southeast Asia. 
The Lincolns proved to be slow and inaccurate compared to other aircraft at the time. Even worse for the Lincolns, their operations in Southeast Asia and basing in Brisbane meant that they were exposed to tropical heat and humidity for the majority of their lives, meaning they quickly began to corrode, which ultimately led to the RAF scrapping the fleet by 1961. This wasn't done without providing the RAF a suitable replacement, however. As mentioned prior, the RAF knew the Lincolns were obsolete, and in December 1949, the Australian government came to an agreement to licence build 48 English Electric Canberra bombers. These aircraft were built by the Government Air Factory and were delivered between 1953 and 1958. In comparison to the Lincolns, the Canberras were much more modern aircraft and were able to fly faster and higher, as well as being equipped with more modern radar. But the Canberras still had issues. They weren't supersonic, meaning they were vulnerable to more modern fighter aircraft. They had no electronic countermeasures, nor a radar to guide them to the target. Which meant that by 1956, the RAF again was seeking a new jet bomber. Curiously, the RAF considered a new bomber force to enter service by 1959. But this was to be made up of either British V-bombers or American B-47 stratojets, of which the V-bombers were the main consideration. However, this was not chosen for a variety of reasons. Namely, the Royal Australian Air Force did not have airfields capable of operating bombers that large, and the actual cost of buying and fielding them. As a result, this was never followed through. In the following years, the government lost interest in updating the bomber force and considered keeping the Canberras in service for a few more years. But by 1962, the situation in Southeast Asia had again changed. The president of Indonesia, a man named Sukarno, was becoming increasingly hostile towards nations like Malaysia and was directly threatening military action in support of Indonesia's geopolitical aims. It didn't help that Indonesia had acquired several modern aircraft in a deal with the Soviet Union, namely 10 MiG-19 Farmer and 22 MiG-21 Fishbed Fighters alongside 26 Tu-16 Badger Bombers. By comparison, Australia's fighter fleet was made up of subsonic CAC Sabre Fighters and the aforementioned Canberras which looked obsolete by comparison. So the RAF decided to push the camera replacement forward in order to remain competitive. The RAF wanted an advanced aircraft to not be left behind and ensure they would remain relevant for years to come. Thus, the RAF considered two main aircraft, the first being the topic of the video, the F-111, while the other was the BAC TSR-2. The TSR-2 could be best described as the British equivalent to the F-111. As mentioned earlier, the main component of the F-111's design, and by extension the TSR-2, is a they were designed for low-level penetration attacks. This stems from an incident in 1960 when an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over the Soviet Union. Prior to this, the assumption was that Soviet missiles and radar couldn't harm aircraft flying fast and at high altitude. But this incident proved otherwise. This event effectively changed Western bombing doctrine overnight, and the mission profile of current and future aircraft was changed because of it. As a result, both the British and United States began development of new bombers to fill this role. So how did the TSR-2 and F-111 differentiate themselves in the eyes of the RAF? Well, in the early 1960s, both were still paper designs, but both still looked promising. Both aircraft had terrain following radar, long ranges, and both were capable of carrying a reconnaissance pallet. The TSR-2 did have one main advantage over the F-111, namely that BAC was willing to allow Australian industry in the construction process. However, as mentioned prior, the F-111 was a controversial project in the United States but the TSR-2 was even more controversial in Britain, with some officials stating that the Royal Air Force should buy Royal Navy Blackburn Buccaneers instead, and the oppositional Labour Party was calling for the project to be cancelled outright. This spooked the RAF, and since there was a good chance that the Royal Air Force would cancel its order, meaning that Australia would be the only operator of the type. Alongside already high purchase costs for the aircraft, this would mean that the lifetime cost of the TSR-2 would be much higher. As a result, in 1963, the RAF decided to purchase the F-111 instead, the RAF's fears were validated in the following year. When Labor came to power on the October 1964 election, they cancelled the TSR project in the following year. There were other aircraft that the RAF investigated, but none were taken as serious as the TSR-2 or F-111. The first was the Dassault Mirage IV, but it was rejected due to its poor hot weather takeoff performance, which was essential for any aircraft operating in Australia or Southeast Asia, alongside its lack of range, low-level performance, and reconnaissance capability. Additionally, the Mirage was deemed too expensive to purchase. The next aircraft was the F-4C Phantom, and while it was more capable of hot weather takeoffs, and it was cheaper, it still had the other issues of the Mirage. The final option was the US Navy's RA-5C Vigilante. While it wasn't ideal, it filled some of the RAF's requirements, and it was in service at the time, meaning it could be delivered as early as 1966 instead of 1968 to 1970 for other aircraft. The biggest issue with the Vigilante was it couldn't do the low-level penetration missions that the RAF wanted. 
It was also hard on existing runways, and it lacked range and strike capability, so it was also rejected. In the end, the RAF ordered 24 F-111Cs with a delivery date of 1968. Between 1963 and 1968, Australia was still left with a gap in the capability of its bomber fleet, and the Americans, wanting to cement the F-111 deal, offered the RAF an interim measure in the form of the B-47 Stratojet. While obsolete itself, it was still more capable than the Canberras, and the Americans were offering them for free, only asking Australia to pay for parts and refurbishment when they returned. However, since the Stratojet couldn't meet the RAF's interim requirements, and introducing it to service required the spanning other squadrons, it was rejected. The Americans then countered by offering F-4C Phantoms and a KC-135 Stratotanker, but this was also rejected for similar reasons. So it seemed that the Canberras would have to last until the F-111s arrived in 1968. In 1967, the first Australian aircrew travelled to America to train on how to operate the F-111, and in 1968, the first F-111 was delivered to the RAF's inventory. But things did not go smoothly. In 1969, the US Air Force deployed six F-111As to Vietnam, where three were lost within the first month. This, combined with major parts like the wing struts failing well before they should, this led to an uproar in Parliament, with the opposition questioning whether Australia should continue with the F-111. An investigation into the cause of these issues led to the grounding of the fleet, and Australia's F-111s were delayed. For America, this wasn't a major issue, since it had lots of capable bombers, but for Australia, this left the RAF with an outdated bomber force, made worse by the fact that Canberra's were now suffering from fatigue issues, meaning they needed replacement as soon as possible. Continuing issues into 1969 and 1970 made it clear that the RAF wouldn't be receiving its new F-111s for a while yet. So in 1970, the RAF was left with a few options. The first was to cancel the F-111Cs outright with no replacement for the Canberra's. The second was to cancel and replace with F-4 and RF-4 Phantoms and tanker aircraft. The third was to cancel the F-111Cs and replace them with F-111Fs. The fourth is to store the F-111Cs and wait for them to be inspected and repaired, and the final option is the same, but acquire an interim aircraft. RAF decided on the latter, primarily due to America's offering to cover the investigations and repairs at their expense. But they still left Australia with a bomber gap that needed to be filled, so the RAF requested either F-4E Phantoms or potentially A-7 Corsairs. Eventually, the RAF acquired 24 F-4E Phantoms, which ended service in 1970. In RAF service, the Phantoms proved popular, and served as a great training aid to the aircrew that would later go on to fly the F-111. The Phantoms even proved so popular, the RAF considered keeping them as a permanent element, but decided against this later. In 1973, the issues with the F-111s were fixed, and Australia returned the Phantoms in two batches, one in 1972 and one in 1973 albeit only 23 were returned, as one was destroyed in an accident. In service, the F-111Cs performed well, and even exceeded the original specifications laid out when they were ordered. However, they were limited due to the nature of the RAF, namely that the RAF had no guided weapons, nor any tanker aircraft, so the RAF was unable to use them to their full effectiveness for the first few years of their service. There was also the issue that none of the delivered aircraft were the required reconnaissance variant, but this was expected, and the RAF converted six of the 24 aircraft to RF-111C specification in 1980. The RAF further expanded the fleet in 1982 with four US Air Force F-111As that were converted to C standard. These were also supplemented by 15 F-111Gs in 1993 and a fleet of spare parts from retired US Air Force F-111As, leading to the fleet consisting of a total of 43 aircraft, of which eight were lost. During their life, the F-111 was never deployed in combat operations. They were considered for deployment to the Gulf War, but this never happened. This isn't to say that they didn't do anything though, and they had a fairly interesting life. The first major event was in the 1980s. At that time, the Tasmanian Liberal government was battling it out with environmental activists over the construction of a new dam in Franklin Gorge. This primarily stemmed over issues related to habitat loss as well as a significant indigenous archaeological site that would be destroyed if the dam were to be constructed. In December 1982, 2,500 protesters blockaded the site and UNESCO listed the Tasmanian Wild Rivers as a World Heritage Site. This was followed by a major protest in Hobart, in which 20,000 people protested the dam. This became a major issue at the 1983 federal election, in which Labor ran on stopping the dam, which contributed to their win. The trend was reversed in Tasmania, however, as the pro-dam Liberal Party secured more of the votes. However, the new Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, immediately led Parliament to pass new legislation protecting World Heritage Sites which led to the federal government instructing the Tasmanian government to stop all work on the dam. The Tasmanian government refused, 
which ultimately led to the federal government instructing the RAF to fly a Mirage 3 fighter and later an RF-111 to photograph the site. These photos were later used in the case Commonwealth vs. Tasmania, in which the court ruled that the federal government had the ability to legislate on issues necessary to enforce international treaties. In Australia, the use of RAF aircraft for spying on state governments and the later court case proved controversial. But either way, this was still the first time a RAF F-111 was used on a proper mission. The only other time RAF F-111s were deployed was part of Australia's contribution to International Emergency Response in East Timor, or INTERFET. Long story short, in 1975 East Timor was invaded by Indonesia under Suharto. This led to a multi-year long occupation, which eventually culminated in multiple massacres committed by the Indonesian government. In 1998, the Australian government, and the international community more broadly, put pressure on the Indonesian government to grant East Timor independence. In 1999, Australia intervened as part of the UN mandate to provide security and ensure there is a smooth transition of power, while a proper UN peacekeeping force can be assembled. As part of this, RAF F-111s were put on standby for reconnaissance or strike missions if necessary. Fortunately, Interfet faced little resistance and the F-111s were never deployed. The final notable incident was in 2006, when Australia intercepted the North Korean ship Pong Su, attempting to smuggle drugs into Australia. The ship was captured and its crew were removed and charged with drug smuggling. The ship was then towed out of sea to be scuttled by an F-111 as target practice. By 2007, the F-111s were getting old and the nature of combat had changed, so I decided to begin replacing them. The original plan was to wait for the F-35 Lightnings to arrive in 2020, but it was decided to replace them with 24 FA-18 Super Hornets beginning in 2010. In their final years, they mostly served as airshow pieces, where they displayed their dump and burn ability, which stemmed from the location of the fuel dump between the two engines. While strongly discouraged by the US Air Force, the practice was common with the Royal Australian Air Force at air shows, and proved very popular. Retirement began with the F-111Gs in 2007, followed by the F-111Cs and RF-111Cs in 2010. Of the aircraft, only 13 were preserved, with the rest being buried at a landfill near Ipswich due to asbestos concerns. Of those preserved, 12 were F-111Cs, while one was an F-111G. With their retirement, the F-111s left a strange legacy. I grew up near RAF Base Williamtown, and I remember when they retired back in 2010. It was a sad time. People loved the F-111. While they had a controversial start, they proved themselves to be effective as the backbone of Australia's Air Force. For a generation of Australians, the F-111s bring memories of dump and burns at major sporting events, air shows and celebrations. It's a shame they had to go, but that's just the nature of time. And hopefully the Super Hornets and Lightnings leave a similar legacy to the F-111 pig.